years ago there was a uh, portion of the coast that was very dangerous. It was known for its rocky offshore, a lot of ships wrecked in that area. And in that area there was a life-saving station. It was a very modest life-saving station. It was a basically a hut. Uh, had one boat, uh, a cot, and a few people who volunteered to man it. And they would go out when there was a shipwreck and try to find lost people in the ocean. And they would bring back what they could find and, and, and save their lives. And it was a very successful station, although it was small. And as time went on, it grew in popularity because the number of people that saved, they wanted to be a part of the life-saving uh, station. And, and then people heard about it and its success. And of course, everybody likes to be a part of success. And, and so they, they came in and they wanted to join. And, and the life-saving station grew and they said, you know, we need more boats so more of us can go out and find lost people lost at sea. And so they bought new boats, uh, multiple boats. And then they said, you know, this hut is really too small for all of us to, to, to gather. So why don't we build a bigger, fancier life-saving station? And they did. They built a nice life-saving station, a huge life-saving station, and they replaced the, the old cots with beds. So the people who were brought in from the sea could be comfortable when they got in. But there was still so much more room, they, they said, let's decorate this. And they decorated it. And they made it very comfortable for everyone. And it really became a place where they would love to come and hang out. And they were, because they were very comfortable. It was very nice. And then, they, you know, a lot of them started to lose interest in actually going out and saving people. So what they did is they hired some crews to man the boats to go out and save people. And so they would have more time to, you know, they still talk about the saving people. But basically they just stayed in the clubhouse and let other people go out and do it. And, and as time went on, one day there was a huge shipwreck. And the crews went out and were able to gather a large number of people and they brought them back. But the people were, and brought them into the thing, but they were dirty. And they were wet and they were nasty. And some of them wore a different color of skin. Some of them talked different languages. I mean, and it really kind of annoyed the people in the life-saving station. They said, you know, really this... They've made quite a mess of our club, or our, our life saving station. So they decided that the maintenance people, they would build another building outside of the, of the life saving station where the people could be washed off before they were brought into the life saving station. And at the next board meeting, that really didn't go over well. And Spill said, You know, we are a life saving station. That's our purpose. And we need to keep that focus. And some of the other people said, Well, you know, if you don't like it, you can leave. And they voted, and they voted to stay the way they were. And the people who didn't like it, well, you know what they did? They left. And they went up the coast, and they built another life-saving station, dedicated to the purpose of saving lives. But as time would have it, the same problems that were at the old life-saving station, as this one grew through time, came to this life-saving station. And again, there was a split. And so on and so on throughout history. And if you go to that part of the coast today, You'll see a lot of clubs there. And people, there are still shipwrecks there. But most of the people drown. And no one is very rarely saved. Because they've lost their mission. They've lost their way. They've lost their purpose. Does that sound familiar? Sound like something you might know? Maybe. Because life-saving stations are much like churches who've lost their way, who've forgotten what their mission was, what they're supposed to be doing. It's not about what goes on in here. You see, we only come here to be refreshed. It's about what goes on out there through those doors. Now, I know, wait, before we even get started, I'm, I'm might be stepping on a few toes. That is not my intention. Truly, it's not. You can put your feet down. I'm not. My intention is not to step on your toes, but my intention is this, is to get you to think, to evaluate, to have that DTR. We talked about it before. You know what a DTR is, right? Defining the relationship. Anybody ever, ever had a DTR? Everybody here has had a DTR at one time. Maybe not about church, 
but about a relationship. Anybody here dated? At some point, you sit down with whoever you're dating, and you have a DTR. And you see if you're going in the same direction. You know, we've been going out for a while. There ain't no ring on this hand. I mean, I need to know something. Are we going somewhere or not going somewhere? Some of that's on the second date. I mean, that is really rough. But we need to know where we're going, right? And we need to know if we're going in the same direction together. So this week, we're going to talk a little bit about church. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about individuals. But who is the church? Not me. We all are. Well, I'm part of it, but we all are the church. Right? So as a church, we need to have this DTR. We need to define who we are, what we're doing, where we're going, make sure we're on the right page and heading in the right direction. And are we in, in line with what God would have us to do? Right? You have been given a, a very important job. And that's to go out and spread the gospel. To spread the good news. That's a tough job, right? It's not easy. Not an easy job. Not something you probably volunteer for to know what you have. That's your job. That's what we're called to do. You have good news. Good news to be spread. See, you're in churches, like I said, it's not about what goes on in here. It's about what goes on out there. See, this is probably the only organization that's not about what can we do for our members. It should be about what can we do for our non-members? People who don't believe. People who don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. What can we do as Christians to get them to understand the salvation story? That's your commission. That's what it says right here. That's your job. J-O-B, job. Write it down. Job description. Okay? That's your job. To go out and spread the good news. You know, there was a there was a, a story I read this week about a gentleman named John Currier in 1949. He was convicted of murder and sentenced to, to to life. And he went to initially the prison was transferred to a, a work farm in, in Tennessee. And ten years passed, and, and they reviewed his case and found that he really wasn't. Guilty, and they sent a letter letting him know that he had been paroled and he could go home. But the letter got lost in the mail, and he never got it. So he continued to work on that farm for another ten years. And a parole officer it came to his attention that this guy was still working, and that he had, you know, that he had been paroled long ago, but he had been wrongly convicted. So he went about his business to make sure. That and go and let this gentleman know that you're free to go. Even though you've been working here for about 20 some years, you're free to go. You were wrongly convicted and you've been set free. The message had been sent, but the message had never been received. How important would it be to you to have received that message? You're the carrier. If Jesus has sent that message out into the world and you're not delivering it, we're having people work and suffer and sin because you're not willing to deliver the message. Several years ago, there was a gentleman, a 54-year-old gentleman, walked into the San Francisco Bay and committed suicide. He drowned himself. And what's so tragic about it was the firefighters and police officers sat there and watched it. And no one did anything to help. And the people, eyewitnesses, were outraged at the fire department and the police officers did nothing about it to stop this job. Somebody pulled his body from the, from the wall. And there was a promise of a thorough investigation that we were going to get to the bottom of this, what happened. And what they said was, what they came up with was this, is we know there was budget cuts in 2009. And so therefore, none of the, none of the firefighters were trained in water rescue. And so they just couldn't go in. They just couldn't go in. And the police officer said, well, you know, we didn't know if he was a danger, if he was on drugs, or what he was doing. We didn't know if he was a danger to us. And, and, and we just couldn't chance it. So we didn't go in. And the people were out there. Because these are the people that are hired to do that. Right? People to save lives. They say, what are, it's like we're living in another country now. 
We just watch people kill themselves. But what do we do? Each week. We watch people commit spiritual suicide all week long. Every day of the week. Each and every day. We say nothing. We do nothing. And stand on the shore. And let them sink. And let them drown. Knowing we have the answer. But are too afraid to say anything. Too afraid. Now I know what you're thinking. You're saying, that's not my job. That's what we hired. That's what we hired the crew to go out and save people, remember? We hired the crews to go out there and say, That's not my job. That's what we hire a preacher. That's their job. Right? That's their job. And to spread that message. You know, the, there was a mayor, uh, Mayor Booker, a couple of years ago, he came home with his security detail to live in. The building next door to him was an apartment building and it was on fire. And uh, the lady said that her and her son had gotten out, but she had a sister who was still up there. And the mayor tried to, to, to go into the building and his security officers, because it was so heavily in plain, grabbed him by the belt to, to hold him back from going in there and he broke loose. And he ran into that building and upstairs and into the kitchen and, and filled with smoke and flames and he said that every time he breathed, it was like breathing in darkness. He said it was just... He, he was looking for a place just to catch his breath. Just to breathe. And then he heard the voice of the young lady. And he followed the voice until he found her. And he put her on his shoulders and he carried her down the stairs into the safety. Everybody's surprised because nobody expected him to come out of that building whatsoever. That building was on fire. Nobody expected him to come out. But yet he did. As the ceiling was falling and, and flames all around him, he carried that young lady out. And they interviewed him afterwards and they said, you know, he's a hero, right? He's brave. He said, you, you, you're a brave man? He said, you're a brave man? He said, I'm not brave. He said, I was scared to death. He said, I was terrified. But if I didn't go in, she was going to die. You see, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's overcoming the fear. There are a lot of people out there who need you. Who are in that burning building and they need to be saved. They need to be brought, asked to come to church. You may have to save them right where they're at. You know, we don't know what situation you're going to encounter each day, but you encounter people every day. And you know, you say, well, the pastor, that's your job. You, you save people. I don't do that. That's not, you know, I'm not at the gym with you. I'm not at your job with you. I'm not at the book club with you. The library, whatever you do during the week, I'm not your job. I'm not there with you. I'm not there with you at the water fountain. I'm not there with you, with you in the break room. I mean, if I could be there and I could tell a story, I'd tell it. I'm not afraid to tell it. But I can't be. And you were just as responsible as I am. And if the mayor Booker had waited for the firefighters to get there, that woman surely would have died. Sometimes we have to take action where we're at. Sometimes... We have to be the minister. Are you ready? Can you be the minister? Are you afraid? It's okay. You can say yes. Because you know what? If I ask most people, I say, I say, why don't you why don't you evangelize? Why don't you talk to people about Jesus? Have you ever spoke to anybody? You know what they would tell me? I'm afraid. You're afraid of what exactly? Well, I'm afraid of what they'll think of me. Goodness gracious, they're coming to Jesus free. I'm afraid of what they'll say. They'll reject me. They'll say that. No! 
Oh, my word, no. It hurts so bad it cuts you right here. I'm afraid to ask them to come to church because they may think I'm crazy right now. Oh, you're all obsessed with that church. I'm afraid. You know the problem with all that? With those answers? Because they all revolve around what? Me. No, no. I'm afraid. What are they going to think about me? And it is not about you. It's about them. You're not the one in need. They're the one in need. If you're the one in need, then we'll try to help you. But if you're, but if you're not, then you need to be helping other people. You don't need to be afraid. You know, the worst thing you can do is get it wrong. I've never seen anything wrong that somebody so that Jesus can't fix. And most of the time, you know, when I get up here and I got a preacher, I got to talk to somebody and I don't know what to say. You know what I say? I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Holy Spirit dwells within me. You talk for me because I don't know what to say. And never been disappointed yet. And you know, there's there's nothing worse than not trying. We were talking all the way over here. We were talking about, I was talking about a student. You went to school with him, talking about this guy. And he would always, he, he would, on a multiple choice test, he would leave the answers blank. And they tried to explain to him, at least guess. You get Color in something. He's like, no, no, I'll get it wrong. I don't know the answer. <laughs> well, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> if you do nothing, you got it wrong. <laughs> if you don't color it, you at least got a one in four or one in three chance of getting it right just by coloring all the A's. You know? Um, but that's how we go through life, isn't it? We're afraid we're going to fail, so we do nothing. It paralyzes us, right? It keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. From doing the, having, fulfilling that great commission of going out and spreading the word to all nations. To everyone we encounter. Now you may not be a, 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 a missionary who goes to Honduras or, or to, to Africa, but you can spread the word right here. There's enough folks right here in this county that don't know the gospel. There's enough folks that you'll encounter each week. This week, go out, count how many people you encounter. Bring them back a number next week. I don't do that. You just spend your whole week on <laughs> And you would be surprised how many hundreds of people you encounter each day. Are you, now, what, what, what are you doing for them? Not about what are they doing for you. This isn't a gym membership. Now, what can you what can you do for me? What can I do for you? What are we doing for them? Are we being good witnesses? Are we living a life that Exemplifies Christ in us. Do we do that? That's a reflective question. Don't answer out loud. I don't need to know. Do we? Do we reflect that? You know, you've all probably already heard that said before. That you may be the only Christ that someone sees today. But are you living that? Are you exemplifying that? Are you are you relaying? That message. You know, so often we get caught up with, with rules that we forget about relationships. We're so afraid of what we'll look like that we forget to love other people. You know, that's the best way you can show Christian, not Christians, what Christians are allowed to love, them, right? To show them that unconditional love that comes from Christ. But are we doing that? Are we doing that as a church? Are we doing that as individuals? Because the individuals make up the church. You know? Before we got to this square building, before we started doing church, we were what? We talked about this before. We were the ecclesia, which is what? Is the movement. The way. The movement. You know what I like about movements? They move. <laughs> Buildings have a way of boxing us in. So everything that goes on is supposed to go on right here. That's the wrong answer. It's supposed to go on out there. You just come here to get refreshed. You just come here for the fellowship and get renewed in the worship of God that created you. And to rejoice in that message that He loved you so much that He sent His only Son to live among men, to die a brutal death, to pay for your sins and to rise again from the dead so that you may have eternal life through the hard work, the hard work of believing in Him. That's it. That's the story 
That's all you have to tell. Did everybody remember that? Let's throw it again. The story is this, that God loved you so much that He sent His only Son to come and live and among men, to die a brutal death for your sins, so that you may receive eternal and rise from the dead, so that you may receive eternal life through your hard work of believing in Him. Wow, is that a hard story? You mean right now? Let me say it one more time. That's not a hard story to tell. They say, "Well, that sounds kind of religious." <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> this is a religion. Uh, <laughs> It is kind of religious. But you know, it's not just those words, but it's your own story. And each of you has a story. And each of you has a journey that you've been on. That started long ago before you ever entered these doors. And your relationship with God. And it's been developing and growing each and every day. And it's brought you to this point where today we need to sit down. We need to have a defining the relationship talk. And if Jesus was sitting across from you, what would he say? And that's the question we need to ask ourselves. I'm not here to step on your toes. I just want you to reflect on that question. If Jesus was here today, what would he say? If we were sitting across the table, candlelight, nice meal, are you committed? Are you all in? Are you ready to put that ring on that finger? You know, what's that song? Would you like to put a ring on it? Is that what you talking about? Uh, you know, the uh, you need you need to be all in. You know, we talked about that before. It's not a partial commitment. It's not a commitment. I commit one hour on Sunday. What about the other days? And what about the rest of Sunday? It's about an all in commitment. It's about a belief. It's about knowing in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. And there is no doubt about it. And there is no doubt where you're going to spend eternity. And you want to take as many people with you as you can possibly take. Because you know what? Taking people with you doesn't diminish where you're going to stay. They're not going to get a better room than you. There's not only there's not like so many rooms with a view. It's not like that. You know? But if I invite them, then what if they get the room with a view and I have them stuck in the middle of the ship and it's just not good? It doesn't work that way. We need to bring as many folks as we can. Invite them to church. If that's all you've got, then invite them to church. But support them where they're at. Love them where they're at. Let them know who you are. Let them know why you are. That's what we're called to do. The Great Commission is not to come to church every Sunday. The Great Commission is to go out into the world and make believers of all nations. Long ago, somebody took that very seriously. The word spread. And it spread. And it spread. And it spread. And this cannot be the generation that it dies in. But it will. If you don't take your job seriously. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.